Um, hi, this is Heidi Clark with the Essex Retorter um, here at the Darkroom Gallery in Essex Junction. And we are interviewing Martine Larocque Gulick, who is running for State Senate from Chittenden Central. We've invited all of the candidates to be interviewed, and uh, Philip Baruth declined. Is there something about you that the voters may not know about that you'd like them to? Um, first of all, I was born in Japan. That's where I started out. My dad was in the Air Force, and he was stationed there. Um, we moved from Japan to Ohio, and my dad, who neither of my parents have a college degree, so um, my dad was in the Air Force as an enlisted man, and my mom was a stay-at-home mom. Uh, and um, in Ohio, we were very poor. We lived in a, uh, a trailer park at the time. There were six of us and a cat in a very small trailer in a trailer park, and um, we made it work. Uh, like I said, um, you know, we, it was a struggle. Um, it was a struggle. My, my family didn't have a lot of money. Uh, but we were able to move from Ohio to Vermont. My dad grew up in New Hampshire, my mom was from Montreal, and so Vermont was sort of this place that they knew and loved, and they, I think they both had this idea that someday maybe we can get back there and raise our family. So we moved to um, South Burlington in the early 70s, and so I grew up most of my, spent most of my life in South Burlington. Um, again, uh, having two parents without college degrees, you know, my dad was really lucky to get a job at IBM, and that really um, helped us, you know, live a good life here in Vermont, in South Burlington in particular. I went to UVM as a student, and I got my, my bachelor's degree and my master's there, and I went on to become a teacher, um, because I was able to do some teaching at UVM while I was getting my master's degree. And I think I may have been the first person in my family to get a graduate degree, um, which is, which is kind of cool. Um, but another thing that folks don't know about me, and it's something that definitely, it's one of the reasons why I felt compelled to run, and it's also something that kind of informs a lot of who I am, is that in 1994, I lost my, my dad to gun violence. So it was a very sudden and violent loss of of my father and it just affected my family in many was ways. Was that here in Vermont? It was not. He was um, in Puerto Rico at the time and he was a victim of a carjacking. So I, for me, it's something that just informs a lot uh, of my beliefs around not only gun safety and common sense gun legislation, but also um, just around, you know, criminal justice, law enforcement, um, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Brian Stevenson, uh, who talks a lot about um, wanting to rehabilitate folks who are in the prison system, and I agree with that. Um, my, my dad was killed by young men. Um, they all ended up going to prison, but my family had to make the decision um, as to whether or not to let those young men out of prison when their time was served, and we decided that we wanted to. Um, because we believe in rehabilitation and redemption and um, young men unfortunately do incredibly stupid things sometimes and we wanted to give these, these, um, these guys another chance. So that's, these are all part of my philosophies when it comes to that landscape around um, you know, security and policing and all of that. I live in Burlington, it's a hot topic, it's an issue that we talk about a lot. Um, so anyway, I wanted to get that out there because I think sometimes folks, you know, they look at you and they, they make guesses about who you are or assumptions and um, those are some things that folks probably don't know about me. You mentioned common sense gun laws. What does that mean to you? Because, you know, there's a lot of um, controversy. Yeah. Uh, about that term. Yeah, there's, you're, there absolutely are. And I think one thing that we can all, you know, understand here in Vermont is that 90% of our gun deaths are suicide. So when I think of common sense gun laws, I think of, you know, um, making sure that guns are housed properly and that they are secured in folks' homes and, and place, you know, places where they live. Um, 
but also like, you know, red flag laws to me, folks who are, are known dangers, um, not allowed to have guns, not allowed to purchase guns. And then there's also one where if we know that a person is having a mental health crisis or that they are a danger to themselves, we can take a gun or a firearm away from them for a certain amount of time until they are better and they're able to cope with the huge, um, I would say, burden and responsibility of owning a firearm. What are some ways you see to um, prevent the propensity for violence, aside from the tool used? Right. Um, I think it's a known fact that when there is, um, you know, when there are things, for example, like income, large gaps in income, when you have desperation, when you have addiction, when you have mental health crises, this is when folks um, act out and often violence is a way of, of acting out. So I think um, one of the things I talk about when I talk about law enforcement is, and this is something that police officers have been asking for for decades, um, support. They know that they need support. They can't do everything on their own when it comes to problems in our communities. They need mental health professionals who can help them and stand by them. They need folks who are trained in addiction and um, how to you know, prevent folks going down the path of addiction. And they need folks who know how to de-escalate um, crises. So that kind of uh, you know, wraparound services, you might call it, but that kind of coordinated care Police officers want it, we need to, to provide that to them. So that's one, one thing that I would talk about. Um, a big piece of mental health care is the lack of it. If you're looking at a big picture, obviously, um, health care in this country is, is, I don't wanna say it's broken, but it is a huge problem and we're heading down a road that seems unsustainable. Um, so I, I've said it before and I'll repeat it, I am, I'm in favor of some kind of you know, single payer health care um, that's centralized and not siloed, that's efficient and effective. Um, I've lived in other countries that have that kind of health care and although there is no perfect system, it's so much more efficient, it's so much more user friendly and I was just provided with so much different kinds of care um, than we have here and the options were just greater and to a certain extent more creative than here. Um, Vermont kind of tried that yeah. briefly. What do you see as the failures in that? And well, I think part of the problem in Vermont, um, this is just from you know, my experience of living here, is like economies of scale. Right. We, we, as much as I know we love our Vermont brand and we love the rural aspect of our state and its beauty, um, which we all profit from in some ways. Um, but there is a point at which, you know, if you don't have the population base and if you don't have the industry, it's hard to pay for things. So, um, you know, I know there are a lot of folks in the legislature um, who talk about, well, we need more people in Vermont. We certainly want our children to be able to live here, but a lot of them leave as soon as they can because they can't find jobs. So, you know, it's, it's, everything's interconnected. Um, we can't just put things into silos, but um, I do think ultimately it would be helpful for us to have a more robust workforce and a more robust um, economy that offers more options to folks. And that would certainly help us develop these economies of scale could, that could pay for healthcare, for example. Your background is in education. Yes. Um, what do you see as the problems with education in Vermont? So I just got back from at the, at the Essex, at the Inn at Essex, I was at a tech center uh, conference today and it was fascinating. Um, lots of great local educators and experts in the field of tech education. Um, so I, first I wanna start with all the great things about education in Vermont. We have such good schools yes. and we have such incredible teachers. Um, I am so proud to be a part of that. I'm on the Burlington School Board. I've been on the board for about five and a half years and I worked in Essex and most of my career was here in Essex and it was an absolutely phenomenal place to work. I have to say you have a great school district and I'm very thankful. So um, 
what are the problems? Well, I mean, one of the things we, we talked about today at the tech conference is, um, you know, obviously funding is always an issue. Um, but also, like, in terms of tech centers and regular schools, academic schools, the integration, where is it? And does it function as good as it could, as well as it could? No, probably not. Um, and around tech centers, we also talked a lot about the stigma that comes with the tech center and how unfortunate that is because for a lot of, especially parents who want their kids to go to that academic four-year rigorous academic program, um, it sort of leaves the tech center out. And um, we talk in education a lot about how our current model of delivering instruction is not working as well as it, it could or should. Do you feel that property taxes are a good way to fund education or do you think we should look for alternatives and what might those look like? Yes, I, so I think um, property tax is not a great way to fund education and I think Phil Baruth brought up a really good point the other night which is just that you know teachers end up being vilified because your tax is going up you know your property tax is going up and they they bear the brunt of yeah. that feeling that just sort of like negative feeling in the community of like well my taxes just went up so that is a really bizarre um, conflict and, and being on a school board I know because I'm kind of that liaison between the community and the school district and the and the teachers and the union and so forth and it's it can be an awkward position to be in um, so uh, property tax doesn't seem to be working. I know a lot of folks are, are talking about income tax, which I think is a great idea, but I do think we need to be cognizant of the fact that there are a lot of folks in Vermont who don't show any income. Um, I don't know the numbers, but I know that there are folks, because I've had them talk to me personally, they show basically no income, but they have a lot of inherited wealth that they are either getting from their parents or their grandparents or they are going to get from their grandparents. Um, and then we also have some retired folks who may not show a lot of income but certainly have, you know, the savings and, and so forth that, that should be, um, that, that sh they should be paying their fair share. So ultimately we have to get to a system that looks at ability to pay, which is probably going to be one that looks at both, you know, maybe some property tax, some income tax, some you know investment wealth and and so forth so it really it's it's not simple and and folks on a fixed income shouldn't have to pay more but there are other folks who are retired and have you know millions of dollars in savings i know some of them and um, thanks for the clarification yeah 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 absolutely um when we retire we benefit from social security and social security is only as robust as the workforce right so it's we're all again we're all interconnected yeah. is there anything i haven't asked that you would want to talk about that i can't ask i'm really excited to be representing essex in the chitman central district i um, as i said the other day um, this district in particular feels like home for me. I, you know, I grew up in South Burlington, but I was just on the other side of Lime Kiln Bridge over on the other side of the, of the runway. And um, Winooski was kind of my backyard. I hung out in Winooski. I spent a lot of time in Winooski. That French-Canadian connection was always there for me since my mom comes from Montreal. Essex was where my, my father worked. He worked for 20 years at IBM. So we always had that connection there. And then the fact that I got to work in Essex for 20 years in the incredible school district that Essex has, it gives me a really strong connection to Essex. And then I've been living in Burlington for close to 30 years, and that's where I raised my kids. My kids went through the school system there, and I've been on the school board. So the district, um, the way you know it got chopped up, and we have all these new districts, and we're all trying to get familiar with them and learn them. I've been walking around with maps trying to teach people about the district, but for me, it feels like home. And so I'm really happy that I hopefully will get to represent folks in Montpelier. We're here with Martine Laroc Gulick running for state senate from Chittenden Central. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for having me.